back to Uninformed Movie Reviews, a podcast with ya boys, the Thirsty Twosome and David. That's Since me. David doesn't want to be a part of our tremendous history in the making. You know, I'd like I'd just like to point out right now, it should be David and the Thirsty Twosome. You, you guys are very much my rhythm section. I was uh, trying to go in order of most <laughs> important. Um, so that's just what I did. We have a very special treat for you today. Our first interview with a filmmaker with a film we're going to discuss. We're usually just here talking to ourselves like a bunch of idiots. Uh, we have Ryan Riddle with us, writer and director of The Music Box. What's up? Hey, man. How's it going, guys? Welcome. Thanks for having yeah. me on. Of course. Ah, thanks for coming, man. We're really excited this... to have you on here. Friends, this might be our first informed movie review. Yeah, hmm. this will be the most informed movie review wow. we ever did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess so. It doesn't get much more to the source than this. <laughs> uh, uh, everyone out listening, I'm going to take a seat back. It's your boy, Danny Two Hands, part of the Thirsty Twosome. I relinquish my seat in the Thirsty Twosome for this episode mm. to David. David, congratulations. You are now part of the I'm okay. I got my again. own chair, man. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sitting back because it'd be weird to interview myself. Uh, I was also a part of this movie. I was the stand in double and action, and usually. Um, yeah, just the stunt man in general. <laughs> yeah, he did great. Thank you. He it does really good work. Got, down that guy's got cat-like reflexes. I've seen it in action. Yeah. It's amazing. I feel it's like really I could impressive. do some stunts. Uh, the only stunts I did was breaking my neck doing the music. So I did the music. Uh, I was the composer of this film. And uh, I really appreciate it, first off, to Ryan. Big, big ups for letting me be part of your movie. And big ups for coming on the podcast. Definitely. Um I do hope to like talk about that process and discuss that with you, but yeah. Yeah. We're definitely right. going to get into it a little bit uh, before we just start berating you with questions, Ryan. Uh, why don't you introduce the viewers to the music box, uh, this delightful little film. Hmm. Uh, so the music box is a Japanese short horror film that I wrote and directed and it's about a young girl and her father who moved to America after experiencing a personal tragedy. And they both deal with it in their own self-destructive way. Um, and eventually they're both haunted by uh, the spirit of the person that they lost. And I just, uh, I really respect what Japanese uh, uh, horror films, how they, I don't know, they just elevate to another level like the, it, their 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 imagery and their themes and their patience um with presenting their um scares i just I, I really admire and i wanted to just kind of pay homage in a way and just try my hand at yeah just like seeing if i could do it <laughs> and this was my attempt and you know yeah I, I'm proud of it and I'm happy with it. I just watched it like before we did this interview and yeah, uh, I think I did okay. And it's fun. Yeah, man. Without going into a uh, full on review mode, I, I really enjoyed it, man. Mm -hmm. It was a really solid watch. Thank you. Um, it was visually pleasing and the story was, I mean, fantastic, man. Uh, really yeah. enjoyed what you did with yeah, it. Yeah, it looks it it looks astounding. And y yeah, I was going to say the the colors, yeah, go ahead. the palettes were like amazing. Uh, that, that was one of my favorite things about the movie. Just like all the deep blues, uh, especially in these like nighttime scenes. Very astounding. Yeah, things. yeah. There were so many moments where, well, before we started filming, there was an idea of what the movie would look like, and we never really approached this film with the idea of making it so dramatic with its color. Mm -hmm. um, but we brought on uh, this guy named Jake Bayless, who we all knew from Las Cruces. Oh, yeah. I knew yeah. Jake Bayless and too. Um, yeah. he is our gaffer. And so, you know, we're like, well, we, you know, we wanted to look yet yeah, the, the moon is blue. The street lights are coming in from the window. So it's kind of like orangey and, you know, I kind of left the visual um, angle of this film up to Bryant, RDP, and Jake, and they kind of coordinated with each other. And I just remember like looking at the monitor that first day and looking at the and just being like, F like it looks so good. It looks beautiful. And our colorist, who's this professional, 
guy out in LA, and I got a really good deal from, he was talking about how he didn't think our uh, color needed to be that exaggerated. But I remember when we were looking at the monitors, somebody had said that they were getting like like old Suspiria vibes uh, from the visuals. And automatically that just like took me there and we just <laughs> decided to like lean into it. We could have made it more natural, more realistic, but I thought that the color was just so beautiful and dramatic that it would be a total waste if we decided to make something that looked more normal, mm. you know? You know, it's interesting, uh, Ryan. Uh, I remember a part of the process, uh, there was a moment in between some of the composing that um, you came over for an appointment and you were like, man, we got the colorist in on this and it just took it to a whole new level. And I remember seeing earlier cuts of it and you're like, check out this new cut. And I was like, just blown away. I mean, the saturation is turned up and it really does, like you're saying, enhance just like all of the aura of the scene, essentially, mm -hmm. like each one of them, especially notably on the beach scene, I'd say. Like when the open the door opens and the sun comes in and she steps out, it's just like a total whitewash, but then you're also just transplanted from such a different dark scene into just this total other vibe completely at the beach. Certainly. And it's kind of funny because just the door opening, we shot for like, we must have done at least 20 takes just to make sure that, you know, the light kind of hit in the right way. Um, and that, you know, the background, the green screen looked like a little bit out of focus, but I don't know. It was, you know, it, it was a beautiful looking film before. And we put, we put it into our editing software and it has something called a LUT and it kind of has like an automatic color correction. Mm. I'm very ignorant to all that. <laughs> so maybe what I'm saying is like complete garbage, but you know, when we were able to give it to our, yeah, our, our colorist, I'm like, dude like this guy's worked on on feature films he's worked on award-winning feature films and the fact that we were able to like get him was through bryant because they worked on a tv show together and i don't know man i'm i'm just super uh happy that we were able to like find these connections and find like all these different people who were down to just like work on it because of connections because we know each other and we respect you know each other's work and um yeah, it's a it's a beautiful looking film. I do really think that that's uh, the strongest aspect of this movie. Oh yeah, man! Aside Every... from the writing, and the directing, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but so it is amazing. I, I actually wanted to ask you a question about. Well, so you were talking a little bit about you know kind of paying homage to Japanese horror movies, and I definitely felt some some a little bit of grudge, especially with the. Uh, the deity, I guess, or not deity, that's the wrong word, the apparition, I guess. Um, that was a, that would be a different take, I think. <laughs> oh, deity would be, yeah. Uh, I watched a different movie. Yeah, like, wow, right? you you inferred some things. I did, but <laughs> yeah. That might be a different amount of context. You got to you gotta make the movie experience your own, everyone. That's that's what I'm trying to teach you today. But um, what were some Japanese movies that really stood out for you? What were you thinking of when you were working on this? I mean, obviously The Grudge. Um that was the first Japanese film that I had seen. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're all the same age. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the ring, that like blew my mind. It's an, it's an American remake. I mean, the director is Gore Verbinski. He's done like Pirates of the Caribbean. He's done a care for wellness. He's a very visual, very, I don't know, artistic director. But I remember because of that, that kind of, pushed me to the um it pushed me to you know the idea of watching foreign films and i had never done that before i was like 13 14 and so i watched the original grudge and that just totally totally like just like scared me out of my mind and then i wanted to experience that fear more and i watched um this film called pulse and i believe the uh mm. the translation is like cairo and it's about how people get addicted to uh, technology and they kind of um, separate themselves from uh, society. And that movie is horrifying. And um, yeah, the Ringu, the original Ring, is fantastic. Like, there's so many good Asian horror films. And when you kind of like spread out and, and, and look at Korean horror films, um, or Chinese horror films, like they they just they they got it. 
and they're so so concentrated on imagery and dread and nobody wants to do pop outs nobody wants to have a loud jump scare they just want you to feel dreadful and show you terrible things and i just i love that i love that form of horror Ryan, I think like to touch a little bit about what you're talking about, like I, I obviously I totally agree because I, I really find like there's an unsettling that leads to like what what actually makes something scary in like Western cinema. But when you're in Eastern cinema already, you're in an unsettling place because you don't know what's mm-hmm. new and you don't know what the formula is in, term, in terms of horror. And when you're in a horror aspect, I mean, there's there's just so many things that can be layered upon to make something fresh. Um, so that's what, what was something when uh, I saw this film for the first time, I was like, wow, this is really interesting because it's it just seems so fresh. It doesn't seem like it's out of like an anthology book or something, you know what I mean? That's just like, oh, I made a horror movie. Oh, okay, so we're gonna have some like, you know, dopey American teenager like running and falling on her knees or something in a slasher film or something, you know? This is like a very creative entry especially for your first entry. Well, thank you. That's, that's nice. (laughs) I, you know, like, yeah, like after the ring came out and that was such a powerhouse film, you know, back when we were like 12 or 13 and then the grudge came out, it was Sarah Michelle Gellar. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, nothing against that film because the original director of Zhuan actually directed the grudge. Um, but there's something a little insincere, I feel, about incorporating um, American actors into your Japanese film. You know, like this this film was like, it was originally intended to be like, Jap- I don't know, Japanese, like it takes place in Japan. I don't think that, especially nowadays, um, especially with Parasite winning Best Picture last year, you know, you want to make something authentic and you want to have actual characters who are used to being in this world. And, and I don't know, like showing them, I'm kind of like losing, I guess, like my point here, but I, I just wanted to make something authentic. I didn't want Japanese influence horror happening to Americans, even though this film takes place in America. I wanted it to just feel authentic, have like Japanese style ghosts with Japanese actors. And there's so few Japanese actors, even in uh, LA. We had a lot of Korean actors. We had a lot of Chinese actors who were saying that they could um, speak their lines phonetically and that they appear to look that way. Mm. But I did not want to go that route i really just wanted to focus on on just that specifically and um that, yeah that was just really important to me so i'm glad it worked out i i totally get what you're saying man i've always felt the same way about like wreck and quarantine it, they're like identical movies it just seemed like american audiences aren't gonna want to read a bunch of subtitles we, we gotta make this thing in english i don't i don't know what it is about that but it's kind of exciting because if parasite had come out in the early 2000s like all these other movies I'm sure there would have been some American adaptation, um, which might have been okay, but what what would be the point? You know what I mean? You just got to watch the original vision of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at Old Boy. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. That's right. yeah. And, and, and Old Boy is incredible. Oh, one um, of the best but movies of course, ever. <laughs> yeah. But of course, they had to like remake it uh, and, for American audiences. And I never um, watched the remake, but didn't they like water it down a little bit at the end too? They like, do. They changed the reveal. They, they make, they I make mean, it a little bit softer. Know, like, there's some stuff that you just cannot get away with in, in, yeah. in American cinema. In American and, cinema. And, and, that, that. and the ending well, of Old yeah. Boy is one of them. There's yeah. a jaw drop. There, that's one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> we need a happier ending. Yeah. People frown upon that stuff. So. I'm sorry. Uh, how did you how did you go about writing this this movie with all this Japanese dialogue? That's what I was wondering the whole time. I was like, does Ryan speak Japanese, and I just don't know this about him or something? Or what what, what was the process of this like? Uh, well, <clears throat> I I wrote it and I just went on Craigslist and uh, I was looking for a Japanese translator, and I was actually able to find a technical translator. And basically, what this woman does is she takes writing um for like and i also hope that this is correct 
but she takes like yeah it's technical writing it's like it, it, it manuals okay. and like d- detailed instructions and she'll take it from english and then she will charge a fee and change it to japanese and apparently this girl is also interested in like i, I think like modeling and and acting hmm. so at the very least i was able to like down to the word get what these english words were in japanese but then i hired another girl um who is interested in acting and you know she knows japanese and kind of being able to translate the technical japanese into more kind of like conversational japanese mm-hmm. so it was like a a, a three step process um, and, and, you know, like the actors that I heard, obviously they speak and understand Japanese. So they were kind of able to manipulate the dialogue in the way that they needed to. Um, but man, it is horrifying being a director and being on set and your actors are talking. You're like, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I don't even know what they are. I, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. It was <laughs> crazy, aspect. man. Yeah. It was, it was a little stressful, but yeah, there's you know, an I had, I had that there. girl, um, the, the actress, the one who uh, knew dialogue um, on set with me. So that that uh, was able, you know, that was able to kind of like help me like through the process. But still, it is um, it is crazy just like watching the actors play out and you're like, I don't know where they are. I don't know exactly like what they're emphasizing, but that just shows the importance of um, uh, rehearsals. What a huge undertaking. For your like, I don't. I know. I know you've done films before this, shorter films, right? But this was meant to be released, right? And what a crazy big undertaking for you to, uh, you know, not only start directing but direct people uh, that are speaking a language other than you that you have no idea if they made a wrong take or if they're emphasizing wrong words or mm-hmm. if it came out how you wanted it. Um, sure. Was there someone when a take was? was made uh next to you like you said the girl was next to you the translation woman that you had was she able to translate what they were saying right after a take was given and then they said well i think we should do another one or i was very adamant on the actors keeping with the dialogue because i needed to be a part of that um agreement you know what I mean? Like we we all needed to like be absolutely like on the same page with like this is this is exactly like what you have to say. This is how you're gonna say it. And you know, like I mean, Japanese like was their first language, but I was able to like speak with them in English, just saying like you know you're like th- this is your daughter and she's talking to you so disrespectfully, and you need to kind of like go you you go for the emotion with your actors as a director i feel even in english and less with the words that are being said however we needed to make sure the words that they were saying were the exact words that were written because we needed to again like be on the same page and know that like our our subtitles were going to be the same you know that the yeah that the movie was just going to progress in that way and um our our girl yui kim who plays monico uh is a phenomenally talented actress and i just like now i just like vomit words at people and as a director i'm just like bah! and they're like okay but with her <laughs> man i would just like say everything i could and she just got it and she's just like okay and i'm like yeah, and, she's like, yeah. <laughs> and then we just did the take and and i was i was so pleased with uh finding her man she was like one out of like four or five actresses that tried out for the part. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. No, oh, all the actors really do a great job. Like nobody's really uh, keeping any anything back. I was really happy with everybody's mm-hmm. right, and it's like such a small ensemble cast. It's like if you get one stinker, it would really <laughs> suck. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, casting. Yeah, yeah. You guys did a great job on the casting for sure. Um, okay. as far as the characters, um, I just wanted to ask a really light question, uh, as far as their, like the meanings of their name in Japanese, did that weigh in on the choosing of the characters names or are they more pulp culture references for you? Yeah, they're pretty pop culture, man. Yeah. I, I, had, I, I thought it was one of the two. You, so yeah. Um, the main character, her name is Mariko and in Juan the Grudge, um, there's a girl in the film and her name is Mariko. And I just, I love that name. It just mm. sounds so nice. 
Um, Hideo, her father, which is never said in the film. It's just his character's name. Um, I believe it's Hideo Nakata, and that is the director of Zhuan. Um, mm. The mother I named Asami for fun because Asami, I think, is the uh, character's name in Audition, which is another fantastic Japanese film. Wow, that's a great film. film. Love yeah. that movie. Uh, and lastly, Rachel, the white girl at the pool, um, is the name of the main character in The Ring. Huh. Bada bing, bada boom. That's nice. a lot of good nods. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I have a tendency of doing that in my last, uh, in my horror film that I made in college. The film, the, the characters were named Jason, Jason Voorhees, Michael, Michael Myers, and Reagan, Reagan from The Exorcist. And I just, I like those little tidbits, I guess. Nice. Fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as like the, the crew, I had noticed it was a lot of like uh, NMSU guys, like guys I remember from like 48 hour film festivals and things like that. Um, is that a crew that you find yourself working with a lot? Uh, and if so, like what's next, what are you guys, what are you guys cooking up for us? Um, yeah, Brian, Brian Markenthal, who I graduated with, who did my senior thesis, senior thesis, he, uh, he DP'd it and he helped me edit and uh, man like we just have a very solid working relationship and we feed off each other a lot noe gomez um who was also a part of my college thesis he was there to do a production design love that guy and yeah like there there's that you know when you when you meet people who you vibe with um just as like a homie but then you can be put into like this like stressful crazy situation um and you can still work with each other and kind of like see eye to eye and figure stuff out yeah then you need to take advantage of that and keep like working with them and they bring out the best in me also the worst but (laughs) you know we've known each other for like almost a decade and i i can't imagine doing another film without them and right now we are I finished writing um, like a political body horror film Ooh. that uh, we're gonna that we're trying to shoot in El Paso, and it uh, basically is about a right wing video content creator who is living in a city where nuclear war is imminent, and he slowly turns into a cockroach. Ooh. Ooh. Whoa. Ooh. <laughs> you, you, oh, how titillating. Let me know if you need anybody to get in on the Alex Jones voices. I'll, I'll, I'll swing in there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've been watching a lot of, um, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of like Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. It's terrible. It's purely <laughs> but, for research purposes. I promise. Exactly. But <laughs> YouTube, uh, YouTube thinks that. You know, that's was, just like the way to think. And, and and people can think the way that they think, and that's totally fine. But I, you know, I, I feel like it's a good opportunity right now to make some sort of statement. It's a good opportunity right now to make potentially a feature. You know, mm. short films can only get you um, so far professionally. So, yeah, I just want to make something small. Um, you know, like one character, one location, but drag out, you know, these sequences and like really delve into this person's mind. Like, why does this person think the way that he thinks? Um, what can I say about the world without sounding like a jerk and, and just go from there and like make something creative and maybe make it black and white and maybe like make it like very like gritty looking and up the contrast and saturation and just get really gross. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited and I'm cleaning out my friend's house. We're trying to shoot in there. Bryant um, is going to be back in town in a couple months. I know Noe has like a project coming up soon. And again, it's like those people that I want to work with specifically, strictly. And I know that they'll have a lot to bring and, yeah, well, you know, the the music box took me almost like nine months, and that doesn't include the writing quick. of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's wow. You know, it's it, it, it's quick, but it you know it's it's a little frustrating because you, you know you have this idea and you're like, we need to shoot this, we need to edit this, we need to promote this, but 
you know, like it's a, it's a long process and, you know, we'll see what happens, <laughs> but we definitely want to shoot it. We definitely want to make it. And the script's there, our actor's there, Brian's there, Noe's there, I'm there. So we'll see what happens. Nice. Good stuff. Uh, just to jump back there. to the music box uh, specifically, uh, I was just interested in the actual music box itself and the process. Uh, is that something you had around? Did you have a specific vision or was it more of like a, you knew it when you see it kind of thing? Um, I mean, we bought it off of Etsy. Nice. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's a good place to and, buy kitschy um, little things. It's funny because Danny with you, we actually tried coming up with uh, like a theme song or like something that the music box would actually play. Mm-hmm. But what was coming out of the music box, I just like, I loved like the melody. I love like the, yeah, just like the whole like sound of it. Um, we actually found out later that it's uh, Around the World in 80 Days, the that's theme right. song to Around yeah. the World in 80 Days, which is what the song plays. But uh, apparently that's, um, you know, that's open to the public. So, yeah, it's open source. Ooh, hey, well, that's <laughs> nice. Dodged, dodged a bullet there. We good. Which ended up working <laughs> out. We good. Yeah. That's funny. I, I thought... love it. I, I love how kind of weird and sad it sounds. And mm. we manipulated the speed for it to be a little bit slower. Nice. Um, or yeah, quicker, it's definitely a little on scene, on, ominous. Yeah. We bought it off Etsy. We had to like break it. We had to buy another one. We had to like, re- yeah, there was a lot of uh, kind of like back and forth on, on what ended up having to happen with it, but. How exciting yeah, that for that Etsy dope. shop owner. They're like, man, business is good this month. I saw two of these <laughs> bad real, Yeah, they're just like, man, we're making money hand over fist. <laughs> um, but man, the, yeah, the cra- like the, the, the cracked, not the cracked mirror, but it's like 16 different little very thin mirrors and the ballerina, it was just perfect. And it was like 50 bucks. Nice. Like, yeah, we need to get this. That's a good find. Yeah. And it I just see, happened yeah. to look a little creepy. Right. Yes. Oh yeah, it yeah. Was, that thing was perfect, man. Yeah, it really was. And I was I was curious about the tune too because I was like, did Danny compose this uh, little music box theme? And if so, how did he get it to sound so much like a music box? It sounds like he <laughs> made one or something. But that makes a lot more sense to me. Um, but um, what was that like, Danny? Like the music part of it? Because I'm just, I'm assuming this is later in the process, right? Like you're watching, kind of like a finished yeah. version of it, more or less. Or did you just kind of yeah. guess? <laughs> I just, you know, I made the music and they made the movie around it and it just happened to work out that wow, way. Wow, that is so cool. You're so, yeah. It was a lot like Fantasia, really. Um, <laughs> Danny's a genius. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's funny we were talking about it because there's there's actually still like a, a hidden track, which if there is a DVD option for the music box at some point, I'd just like to throw that in there. Just like there wasn't a separate music box uh, song that we made, but we did end up going with around the world in 80 days because it just seemed so natural and it just ended up working best for Uh, it. But when I was making the music box, uh, song itself, um, I actually based it off of a a Japanese folk song called, um, Teru Teru Bozu. And, uh, it was a really creepy, it had like a really creepy backstory and it was about, I think that the, the Bozu, I, I can't quite remember the Bozu is like a small, um, it's almost like a wicker man toy or figurine that Japanese like uh, kids make. And it's almost like a ghost, like a Japanese ghost that you hang out around your, like your house and stuff like that. So it was almost like a ring around the rosy kind of song. And I wanted to like incorporate that in there a bit. Hmm. Um, and then I kind of definitely kept that theme as the music went along, but like, as far as like the process for music went, um, yeah, at the point that I had came in, uh, I th- well, principal photography was all wrapped, wrapped up. Um, most of the, I think all editing was done at that point. Right. Yeah. And, and, um, all editing was done. I mean, really there was just no sound. There were, um, like f- filler songs that, that Ryan kind of had an idea of over, um, over parts in the movie. And he was like, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling this. And it was some other copyrighted things that we can't say right now, but, um, but it was really good to get an idea because him and I would sit down and we watched it and he would send it to me and I would just be like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing so many like ideas and influences on this. And uh, a lot of it was really interesting. I've, I've composed for like a short film before. Um, I think it was like a student film. And then I've done uh, some like test music for like a, a couple of 
local made video games in like Las Cruces area and stuff like that. But I'd never done like a, a real short film, even though, I mean, this is probably the longest length film I've done. This is what, 20, 25 minutes, I'd say. So yeah. what are some of these influences you were thinking about, Danny? Because I definitely, when I, when I was watching the movie, there was like two big names that popped out of my mind. And I'm wondering if I was right. Okay. We um, can like talk about them, right? Like we can talk about like these, these artists and like these yeah. songs. As long as you're yeah. not, yeah, as you, long as you're not singing them. You like, can pay as long as I didn't exactly someone. record them down. Yeah. From yeah. Our, yeah <laughs> they're, they're all like musicals. So it would just be like harmonizing. Vocals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean like, I know that Ryan and I have talked before we ever worked on something together of just like some horror. We like um, shot the crap about some, some horror. Because uh, we're really into modern horror and, and um, you know, art house flicks even too. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of it which came to mind was obviously we had some of the sound from The Witch in mind mm. um, because the soundtrack from it is incredible. And um, I, I personally, when I'm thinking about like not a haunted house horror soundtrack or anything like that, I really wanted to try and and use more of a sonic influence if that makes sense less tonal and more um m more startling sounds mm. really and and oh and uh, ominous tones clashing with each other uh and then you know sudden there's there's actually like some sudden uh riffy leads um and like sudden like almost like a video game uh bit crusher on the bass at some points i think on the first song there's this large thump that actually rings out with like a bit crusher arcade oh yeah too. that that part's great it's like right right <laughs> on the the change like it's like a editing point almost yeah it's like that boom, boom. yeah it's great yeah we definitely timed that ryan and i were just like that has to happen you know but there was also especially in the th the third song that was an interesting process uh which is when asami is coming out of the box yeah. Um, spoiler alert. Dang. Uh, Dang. Come on, man. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so that was a transition from the Around the World in 80 Days song uh, and kind of got delayed out. And then it was just a continuous concophonous tone uh, with a bunch of themes over it. And Ryan and I sat there pretty much frame by frame almost and just stop, start, stop, start. This is what I want to happen this is what I wanted to happen. And Ryan and Ryan was pretty much right next to me. And we were, he was kind of directing how it would go. Um, and my computer is kind of an old computer. <laughs> it's kind of like a 2015 yeah. <laughs> MacBook, and it happened to be right when things were getting hot. So obviously it was super hot in here. My computer was kind of dying out every five seconds because I was using so much CPU by like having samples going and all of this stuff. And anyone that's doing digital production can kind of tell you, I mean, it's hard enough doing that stuff when you have no video, but when you're also watching video in playback and timing it exactly oh, to it. Oh yeah. It's just adding mess. video to the mix when down. you got all the MIDI stuff running and everything. It's like, all right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The MIDI was taking up so many processing, uh, so much proce processing power. Hour. And you know the third the third song was definitely the most challenge. And but I, I think as far as the second song, which takes place when um, Monaco is stepping out onto the beach in the dream sequence, um, that one was pretty much uh, improvised. Like mm. Ryan was here, he gave me an idea of what he wanted for the scene, and uh, I had a couple of MIDI sequencers out, and I was just like, okay. Let me try something really quick. So he was here and I just like fiddled with it and I got the general skeleton of everything just by watching the watching it happen in real time and then I was playing in real time and kind of adjusting after that. Um but that one was very smooth. That one like came out pretty easily, but um, Yeah, I love that. I love that uh, that version that you came up with. <clears throat> and that was Thanks. the one that was um kind of like heavily influenced on the witch when we during our editing process, we would you know, throw in our own sound effects and we threw in music where we knew we wanted music. Um, the first one was something from uh, It Follows uh, from Disaster Piece, like that moment when, you know, she sees the thing in the box and then we pull out from the apartment. The second on the beach is from The Witch, which is like one of the scariest, like, yeah, like soundtracks mm. ever. Oh, yeah. And we were able to kind of like manipulate all these, like, you know notes and kind of like harmonizing and yeah that last one danny he 
it, it's funny because he probably had about half of the track completed before uh, me and Bryant showed up to work on that last track together. And it was just beautiful and like horrifying. And yeah, that last day was really stressful. We were there probably like 12 <laughs> or 13 hours. Yeah. Just like perfecting the like one song and then just like really like finalizing this last thing. But man, ah, it sounds so good. And our source of inspiration for that last song um, was from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh. And it's just this horrifying music. Some Ligeti. Some Yogi yeah, Ligeti. Yeah. The whole and, time, I was like, this man. is Ligeti, man. This is what's going on here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are Space well, Odyssey. That's the thing. Like, we were, you know, we were, it, it's funny because when you're editing, you're so used to hearing, like, what you hear while you edit. And you're watching these scenes again and again and again and again. And you have this track that you lay under it. And you're like, well, that's the music that plays with this scene. That's just <laughs> what it is. But Danny was able to bring, you know, his influence and like inspiration for that song because that's what we wanted and just make something like super dope. You know, like you, I, I remember you talking about like at the beginning, it kind of sounds like a, like bees, like a swarm oh, of yep. bees. There was like a like swarm of flies thing. and bees in there. God. Yeah. I love, yeah. I just watched it. I just watched the music box before this and, and that, that music just like, it's, thank uh, you. It's uh, yeah, it's over. It was it was super fun. I, I really wanted to get as close to that Ligeti track as possible because obviously I'm a huge 2001 Space Odyssey fan. But I mean, I, I, I remember you showing me it and I was like, dude, this is exactly what I was hearing when I saw this scene. For sure. This needs to happen. And uh, it, it's kind of hard to do when I don't have like an 80 person choir. But <laughs> <laughs> that I can conduct or I like that. Yeah, dude, I remember you like getting like at, at that point, dude, we've been working for like eight hours or something. You're like, well, I don't have a like a hundred person core. I'm like, ah. I was uh, like, I can't frustrating. Do the Danny is one of my favorite Dannys. That's a good Danny, man. <laughs> uh, but a lot of it, it was really interesting. There's so many parts to that last song because it's like, like you're saying, there's like a, 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 a like a swarm of bees in the beginning, and then there's a thumping motion where Asami is coming out of the box and, and scraping on the floor. And the moment that really felt the most like that Ligeti track is when Asami like reaches out to Monaco and oh, yeah. get that shot of the two hands. And it's beautiful. there's a moment where the, the choir yeah. comes in at the same time. And I was just like, we did it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like it's, it's, it's like, I don't know. I, it, it's like almost like unbelievable that like we were able to like come up with that. And of course, like there's the inspiration. Of course, that song is a masterpiece, but you know what you, yeah what you were able to like manipulate and what we were able to do and create like damn it just we did uh, it. it it works and complements the visuals like so well it's amazing it yeah. was an amazing process yeah it was fun <laughs> it was it was stressful <laughs> and like time consuming but man it was worth it yeah i would uh I would have to agree with you, man. Pretty complete package. Uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend to a friend. Uh, go out and check it out. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, is there a, I mean, is there a place that people can check out the music box? If they hear this podcast and they're like, I'd love to watch this short film. Well, they can certainly follow us on Facebook and Instagram um, at the music box short film. Right now I'm focused on um, just taking this through the film festival route and seeing like what accolades and laurels we can uh, collect. Mm. I would love to have this on Amazon or like shutter or something like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, they'll, you know, they'll, they even take short films and they, and they take things that aren't like the greatest quality, but nice. Yeah. But I want to get it through. Yeah. I want to get it through the film festival circuit first. And I want to kind of like prove myself and, and what we're able to do on a small budget so that we can make, you know, this cockroach idea, we can make <laughs> feature films or something a little bit more extravagant, like down the line. And, um, this, this whole film came out of my pocket. So the next one can't, the next one needs to be from a bunch of different people who can help us out. So maybe in like, six months we'll start um looking at places where we can you know host this film uh but for now we're on the social media route we're collecting laurels and you know we'll just keep people updated through that through instagram and facebook beautiful stay you know, tuned if we had an award or a accolade to give you we would but we're simple men 
Well, <laughs> this is more meaningful than a laurel that I can throw in my poster. Talking about you guys has been a lot of fun, and answering you know these questions has been awesome. And yeah, you know, thank I have you for doing that. I have something, Ryan. Before we move off of the of the topic, I uh, obviously first thank you for being here, but I also want to say, uh, is there anything I know after like being friends with a lot of people in in um, film? Um, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? And for the film program in NMSU and some in UTEP also, I know going to school for this stuff is really difficult and it's a lot of work, but it's super fun. Could you tell us a bit about like, I maybe there's an aspiring filmmaker like listening or something. Can you tell us, I know it's hard to boil it down to like maybe three things, but can you give us three things that are challenges that you'd say everyone should look forward to overcoming when you do your first, um, you know, your first, I guess your debut film really. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry to throw a curveball. Yeah, I love how you're like, I mean, it'd be tough to do three, but I'm going to ask you for exactly three. I'm going to three. ask you to I do want that. 17 examples. <laughs> <laughs> Annotated. <laughs> ah, man, I don't know. I, um, I feel like I can start somewhere and kind of like see where it ends up, but... <laughs> Uh, that's how all our thoughts are. I here. was gonna say that's yeah, that's our style, it, man. Just get thrown. <laughs> I feel like I can start with saying that <clears throat> obviously film school isn't necessary, but it allows you an avenue to meet a myriad of people with a myriad of talents. So I guess I could say that filmmaking is a collaborative process. And you, you know, I, yeah, like I, I wrote it, then I directed it, and then it was done, and I edited it. Now I'm like promoting it, you know, during the film, like I produced it. And you need to be ready to collaborate with people. And people are going to want to help you. People are going to want to get involved and maybe like step in. And working with people is the only way that you can make a movie. Um, there's no way this film could look or sound or, you know, be anything like with just me or three people. Um, that's one. <laughs> oh, I think that, I think that covers all your yeah, ground. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Like just, just make good relationships with people, people that you love, people that you respect, uh, and people that you like working with and incorporate them into as many projects as possible. And learn how they work and, and learn what they do when they get stressed uh, and learn, you know, how you can like positively reinforce them. It's it's just all about like maintaining like good working, friendly relationships. And I think once you have that down and you see people who you think are legitimately talented and then impress you, work with them and keep working with them and, and give them a reason to keep working with you, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, man, you thought you couldn't do it. You did that. You stuck the landing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, man. It. Uh, yeah, the, the whole process was insane, and I didn't think that I could do it. And when I told people that I wanted to make a Japanese horror film, they're like, that's dumb. Like, you're not going to do that. And I'm like, you're, you're right. Like, maybe I can't, but... You know, through friends like pushing me through like my own like work ethic, it, it did, and now it's done, and now it's time to do something else. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of time to do something else, everybody, I think it's time we wrap this uh, this little podcast up, and we got something, Ryan. We got something to introduce you to, uh, my friend wait. here. So, every podcast ends with a segment called peeps and predicts and what is that well we have two jars except frank forgot one of the jars because he's real all dumb. right two so, weeks in a row so, keep it rolling so today we have one <laughs> jar that will serve us as two jars um but basically we got a bunch of people in here real or fictional we're okay. gonna pull one of these out of here and then uh we're gonna have a little uh a little debate um and and the people that we're talking about today are so hope this one doesn't suck. Ooh, the anticipation. <laughs> we got Zach Baggins versus the Warrens. Oh. Yikes! Oh, God. Are, are you familiar, wait, wait, wait. Are you familiar with Who, uh, Zach? The Baggins? Warrens from The Conjuring. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and 
Zach Baggins. Yes. <laughs> he's Is that the- a hobbit? Oh <laughs> uh, no, he's the uh he's the Zach curator Baggins of Bag End. <laughs> <laughs> he's the curator of uh what is it what is it cuz I always give it a ghost, fake name. Ghost Hunter, Zach isn't it? Baggins. Oh god. Or yeah, he's he's that ghost <laughs> oh, hunter who wears no. all the affliction tees. Yes. Um I always call it Zach Baggins House of Baggery, and now I don't remember what the actual name is anymore. He's always trying to start fights with ghosts. Yeah. What's up, bro? <laughs> Come on, bro. I'm right here, bro. That's right. That's right. Okay. So these are our two people. <laughs> and our predicaments. Let me switch out the jars. As I'm glad that these peeps are left over from our Conjuring episode. This is fantastic. Yeah, we did a Conjuring episode maybe a month or two ago. So now it's like it knew. It knew horror was in the air. And it knew to bring oh, them back. Wow. That's, That's right. right. I need to, you are yeah, the beginning of our spooky stuff. month. Say again? You're the beginning of our spooky month. Yeah, for spooky real. Spooky month. Yeah, yeah you're, you're kicking gonna, off October for, for us. This is going to be an October 1st release. So it's going to be the first on our on our spooktober <laughs> celebration or whatever. We're That's not calling sick. it that. Okay. Who would have who, who would have the tighter 10 minutes of stand up? <laughs> Zach Baggins or the Warrens? <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> Team stand up can be tricky, but when pulled off, it's yeah. very strong. And let's be honest, those two shysters have been putting up a front for like 40 years. Yeah, they're so improv pros. They know how to work off each other really well. That is a very good point. I think point. the Warrens are kind of pulling here. Zach Baggins, I don't think, is very funny, just objectively. I, I feel like he would be like Dane Cook if he hit up a mic. <laughs> oh, yikes. Yeah. Maybe so. You're right on, actually, man. I don't know if I've ever laughed at anybody in an affliction tea, except for like <laughs> laughing at them. You know at what I mean? The, at their expense. Yeah. Uh, what say you, Ryan? <laughs> man, I mean, <laughs> there's there's a lot of laugh and, and humor to be had with somebody like a ghost hunter, Zach Baggins. Because of maybe how like awkward and bad it is, <laughs> but on the other hand, I feel like kind of like with Jerry, like Jerry Seinfeld or comedians from just like back in the day, and I have absolutely nobody specific that I can reference. But it, I don't know, man. I feel like if it's both Warrens, Barry Farmiga, and uh, Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> um they're adorable and that relationship very Dang. like g-rated like humor just like kind of like bouncing back and forth with each other i think it'd be like very endearing that's true um, i know what i would pay for and it would be to watch them do stand up for 10 minutes it'd be like they would do they would do a solid eight and then and then night owl would bring out his acoustic guitar and they'd sing some elvis and they'd send everybody <laughs> home it'd be perfect man it doesn't get better all right, uh, I think we're giving round one to the Warrens. Okay, so let's see if we're if we're, let's see if we're gonna wrap this up. Bless or their move hearts. On, so, round two, we do a two out of three setup here, Ryan. So round okay. two, and this one's just for you all. Okay, I, I wrote this one right before the show. I was like, you know what, the right people are here. Who would win in a fist fight against Jake Bonner? <laughs> Zach Baggins <laughs> or the Warrens? <laughs> How delightful. <laughs> Well, I really hope he listens to this one. I gotta <laughs> say. Well, this is a tough one. I'm going to be honest because I've seen Jake in many fist fights over the years that I've known him, and either of these people could be Jake in a fist fight. <laughs> uh, the list of people who can't be Jake in a fist fight is very short. Yeah, this is extensive. This is tough. Yeah, both are probably pretty capable. I mean, are we talking about the Warrens right now? Because <laughs> oh, well, I mean, yeah. one of them is dead. Yeah, one of them is dead and the other one's very old. <laughs> both of them Not are dead now. Them. Oh, no, yeah, they both are dead now. Yeah. So finally. Yeah. So I don't know if Jake can lose against a dead body. He might lose against two. He <laughs> might trip over it, although there is a chance he might pull out. Um, uh, yeah, but I think we'd have to give this one to Zach Baggins just because... I mean, even if they did, we're ghosties. Ghosties can't hurt you. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there technically can't even be a fight, a real fight here. They could torment him for sure. Hmm. Are you saying Zach Baggins versus the Warrens or Jake Bonner versus the Warrens? <laughs> yeah, Both. no, it would no. be Jake Jake versus the Warrens or Jake versus Zach Baggins. <laughs> oh, um, I think I, I think with like most of these ghost hunters, they're very bro-duty and uh-huh. they probably worked out a lot 
I don't know if Bonner would stand a chance, man. As much as I love him, I, I dude, he would get wrecked. Yeah. Uh, but between like two ninety-year-old people, one of which is dead, one of which maybe are also dead, dude, Bonner would come out on top. No question. Jake's just yeah. coming out, beating up you know, old ladies. Yeah, that is the fight where I would have to put my money on Jake and be like, you know, I think he's got this one. I know I'd be horrified and I'd have to call the police, but oh. I think he would win. Well, then I, I mean I think that's it, right? We get we got the the Warrens coming out on top. Oh my god! Or did I miss no, Captain? no, really you, glad uh, the Warrens yeah, won over the, Zach, Zach Baggins won this round. Isn't it? Oh, because yeah, because there's more yeah, likely to win. beat. Or would Jake win? Are we talking about Jake winning? That's not <laughs> Who's more now. likely to win a fist fight? <laughs> okay, with Jake Bonner. Yeah. So then that is Zach Baggins. Yeah. Sorry, okay. Jake. Zach, Zach Baggins yeah. has you. Uh, I'm, I'm getting tired of You're still a winner to us, Jake. <laughs> I hope you hear this, Jake, and you remember that you've wasted all these years, and you got a fight coming up at the end of the year, bud. I'm very yeah, excited to kill you with Jake my fist. Bonner. I gotta reach out to that guy. Year number thirty, he's supposed to be in a title fight with Frank. That's yeah, true. Jake and I have had this ongoing bet going for like nine years. Uh, he talked <laughs> a lot of crap at the beginning of this. Uh, he he used to say that he would be Terry Crews big by now, and I don't know if you've seen Jake uh, recently, but that hasn't happened. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In what? In no world, in no world is Jake going to be Terry Crews big. Yeah, but apparently Frank and Jake are going to fist fight. What? What is it? Christmas? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it should be at the end of this year. The end of this year. Yeah, it's supposed to be Christmas. We're going to film it. We're going to make it a production for the channel. It has to be. It should point. be fun. And it'll be socially distanced and virtual, so everyone can tune in. <laughs> Except they won't. Oh, Frank geez. will be pummeling Jake in the face. Okay, uh, let's do our let's do our our last one. Here's our tiebreaker. We got to figure out who wins today: Zach Baggins and the House of Bagginry or the Warrens. Who would come up with the best prompt for a hypothetical debate segment? Sick. We're getting meta on this last one. Who's gonna come up with the best? Who's gonna come up with the best ideas to write? Um, and I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say this. I don't know anything about Zach Baggins, really. I only have made fun of him. But from my knowledge... I went to his museum. Yeah, you guys went to his museum in Vegas. But to to my knowledge, he doesn't really do much creatively other than like, what's up? What's up, ghost? What's up? What's going on, bro? Whereas the Warrens, you know, either way you look at it, if you think their exploits are real or not, they've definitely told many tales. And have been oh, yeah. far more creative people, I think. They've been part of like legal battles before, so <laughs> I would say they probably can have a debate. I would imagine well, so. Point. I don't think anyone in, a, in, a, in an affliction t-shirt can debate. I think that's like a, it's just like a bottom line thing. If I remember correctly from high school, that is one of the debate rules. You cannot wear an affliction t-shirt. <laughs> it's rule number three. When rule I, number three. Yeah, when I was doing LD back in the day. Wow. <laughs> Were you Lincoln or Douglas? Uh, no, I was joking. Was that a little debating? Is that what that stands for? A <laughs> little debating. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> he was a master debater. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I would have to give this to the Warrens as well. As well. They definitely know how to spin a tale. Yeah. Uh, they've come up with some stuff. They've come up with three movies, fool. And I really just don't want to give Zach Baggins another win, if I'm being 100% honest. Yeah. I don't I don't either. And I think Zach Baggins is not the person that I'm thinking of. Because I'm thinking of, like, the Ghost Hunters guy with the glasses and the That's hair. Him. That That's is the him! Okay, that is no, the then, okay, nah. It's going to be Zach Baggins. <laughs> because he has the ability to manipulate an argument in his favor. If something isn't going right... Oh, well, it's because the spirits are in very strong in this corner. Oh, guys, stop playing with the Ouija board. We need to go out here where the, where the ghosts are like really happening. I think, I think that, and I forget what the question was, but I think that the Warrens would accept that there is no ghost activity and they would say that this that this is like there's a logical explanation behind this whereas Zach Baggins would manipulate that and try to prove that you know leaky pipes is indeed a demon you know what himself there's a point in there and I think it's that Zach Baggins has also ran a show with possibly more episodes 
and yeah. more more mm. improvising of dead space. I didn't take that into account. He is putting out a lot more content than the Warrens, right? especially these and days. And a this, ton of it. Yeah. yeah. In this case, Even if there is a logical explanation, <laughs> no, it is a yeah. ghost or probably a demon. In Zach Baggins' case, it is quantity over quality. Yes. You know what? I gotta feel like you've turned me, guys. I, I'm, I'm on team. I'm on team Zach Baggins, and I would have never guessed it. I also feel swayed. Is very unfortunate. For this <laughs> I don't want to give it to him. Yeah, um, <laughs> but man, apparently there's a Halloween episode of Ghost Hunters, and it's live. Yes. And even though nothing is happening, <laughs> and people are calling him out, he's like, "No, this place is haunted." <laughs> and, and man, I dis- I I just really hate what that guy stands for i don't hate him i hate what he stands for and how he has exploited he's just got that conviction the travel, channel. <laughs> yeah. the travel channel should be about hawaii Damn it. that's what that's the takeaway from today if you're gonna learn anything from this episode is that the travel channels for travel folks that's that right. is a hot take let's all calm down hot take. <laughs> does that mean zach baggins is the winner of that predict by unanimous decision it our champion so. is Zach he would beat the crap out of bonner and, <laughs> and he, yeah and he would be able to manipulate an argument in his favor that it is a demon well i mean ladies and gentlemen that's it we've come to a consensus we've peeps we've predict and now we're at the end of the show if you enjoyed this podcast of course tune in for more podcasts we're gonna be getting real crazy and I think, what's the next one? We're gonna we're gonna be Wait talking about our favorite zombie movies. That's what's next. Wait a second. Who was the winner of last Peeps and Predict? Oh, so this is a bonus episode. So this oh. is more of a uh, exhibition match, yeah. if you will. <laughs> it's a preseason doesn't, game. Doesn't count towards the championship. <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, there's gotcha. a more complex structure, Ryan. We'll have to we'll have to catch up on it. But <laughs> I, there's yeah, a whole bracket, I can't wait. everything. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you guys like the episode, uh, you know, check out David and Frank and Beans. You know, the podcast platforms are they're there. You can you pick know whichever one you want. We're on it. Okay, we're yeah. there. And be uh, sure to check out the music box short film, right? Stuff. Yeah, Follow please it. do. Yeah, Stay just like tuned. keeping up, keep, keep updated. We we like to just have shout outs. Um, anytime we win an award or gain a laurel or an official selection, we just like to include that. So on Facebook and Instagram, hopefully within the next six months, uh, we'll be able to publicly just screen it for everybody. But until then, just sit tight and yeah. That's Ryan it. Riddle. Thanks for being Thank with us. Yeah, this was so much fun. I had a blast. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks for being here. It's good here. seeing your face. It's good seeing you guys. Uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. All I right, really I'm going to kick it. you out of this meeting now. This thing's over. Mm-hmm.